and I'm delighted to welcome Claire, who is Professor of Digital Humanities in the Department of English at the University of Durham and was previous Vice Chancellor for Research there. She's also been the head of UCL Department of Information Studies and director at the UCL Centre for Digital Humanities and began her academic career as a lecturer at Sheffield University's iSchool. And going back even further, her PhD is from Cambridge and was in English literature, followed by a postdoctoral position at Oxford University's Humanities Computing Unit and Faculty of English. So what we're going to do today and why I'm saying we need a little bit of your help is Claire's going to offer short provocation talking about managing the digital dystopia um, and then we'll have some discussion afterwards. Now we also gave you and Claire submitted a pre-leading list so I'm hoping some of you will have had a wee look at it and it will have stimulated some thoughts and questions you would like to ask to start this conversation. So as Claire's talking please do pop your questions in the Q&A. I'm hoping to see a fair few there very shortly and then I'll start the conversation conversation at the end and ask and go through those conversations and start that going once we've finished. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Claire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, it's amazing to see, or rather not to see, because I can't really see all of you, but it's amazing to be aware that there are so many of us here. And actually, you know, let's start off on a positive note. In a funny way, this is one of the very good things about the digital. Um, I've had a couple of experiences now where I've done something similar, where I've been on Zoom and I've been speaking with um, people around the world, um, hundreds of people potentially there, usually bigger than, um, or more people around them than I would normally um, talk to if it were um, a kind of research seminar or something like that, because it tends to assume that people have to be in the room. So I find this kind of interesting that one of the positives of what we've had to learn to do in COVID is to work at a distance, but yet working at a distance does allow us to, as it were, be in places that we couldn't physically be in. At some point in October, I went in, the, in digital space from India to France to the UK to, can't remember where else it was, but anyway, couldn't possibly have done that in a week physically, or at least it might have been difficult. So I think, you know, let's not say that digital things are terrible. They are not. But what I want to talk about today is some of the issues that I think, as Kirsty said, COVID has brought into focus about how do we literally, how do we feel about digital environments and how do we negotiate them? Um, and is there a danger that our experience of enforced um, enforced presence, as it were, online has meant that we have had to come up against some of the more unpleasant <laughs> examples of, of the digital or, or some of the things that about digital things that worry us? Um, this isn't necessarily predictable. At the moment, I'm on research leave and I'm writing a book about the history of cyberspace. And in that book, I've been looking at you know, various things about what I talk about in cyberspace is like really the, the internet of the 1990s when it was really very new and it was very newly privatized. Um, therefore, I've been coming up against many of the predictions that were made at the time. And, and it's, it's interesting that at the time, a lot of people thought that by now we would pretty much be doing everything online and happy to do so, that you, we would be a particular interest for many librarians. You know, the, the death of the book was widely predicted. It was assumed that we'd all be reading everything in digital form very soon, uh, certainly by now, um, that pretty much uh, much of university learning would be done online, uh, that people would simply not need to go to physical universities uh, on the basis that once you could connect uh, via a computer network, um, then why would you need physical presence? Um, equally, there were very optimistic predictions made about working from home and, you know, why would people need to commute and wouldn't it be great because the traffic would be far less serious. And, um, it, you know, again, the, all of these assumptions, they even stretch to the ideas of perhaps we wouldn't even have to go to museums or galleries, you know, as long as we could see digital images of a museum object or a, um, an artwork, perhaps we didn't even need to be there. 
Um, that all sounds fairly bonkers now, but you know, there were there were these these really kind of optimistic or pessimistic, depending on the, the way you want to look at it, predictions, and people were exploring the idea of online community. Um, you know, people were hanging out in small or large even um, bulletin board systems and thinking that this might be an alternative way to socialize. This might be a way to extend consciousness, a way to recreate community. Um, so at the time, you know, the beginning of the 1990s, in many ways, um, people were being very optimistic about a lot of digital phenomena in, and had the idea that, I'm, I'm sure many people on this call will be able to remember it, if you digitized um, things uh, like uh, museum objects or images of text or whatever, people would no longer need to see the physical object, which would be particularly useful where things are fragile um, and you know, handling would damage them. Um, you know, the amazing work that Andrew Prescott, for example, did on the uh, Beowulf manuscript with colleagues at the British Library would be a very good example of that. And we also were somewhat prey in, at the time, and it's been remarkably um, persistent to this myth of the digital native. So the idea being that younger people, OK, some of us old people would, might find uh, digital things a bit of a challenge. But, you know, once the new generation of kids came up and they've you know in these days you still hear it said oh yes they've been using iPads since they're tiny so they'll feel much more comfortable with this these all of these things are transitional they'll go away turns out not so much um I think one of the you know the major fallacies that has affected our our relationship with digital and physical things is the myth of replacement you know a lot of those ideas that were being knocked around in the 1990s were talking about the digital as a replacement for the physical. So we wouldn't need, you know, it sounds crazy, but we wouldn't need to go to a museum because it would be just as good to see a museum object online. Um, it, it turns out that, and of course, the more we digitize things as uh, the British Library soon found with the Beowulf manuscript and others, uh, the more people actually want to see things. They, you know, they are captivated by real things. So the more it is digitized, the more fascinating the idea of the physical object becomes. So in a sense, one could say this is a, in a sort of way given birth to some of these digital dystopian ideas in that, you know, the more people have had to work at home, as in the more people there are doing it and the more time all of us have had to spend online, many people have been coming up against the idea of this feeling it's not a replacement at all. You know, it really isn't a replacement for many people, for their um, social environments, for their working environments. Um, and therefore we've had, you know, I think one of the things that we need to really be clear about is digital does not replace physical. It always augments in possibly in different ways, but it augments, it is not a, a, a good replacement. Um, and in a sense, a lot of the, you know, some of the, the rhetoric about isn't digital wonderful or wouldn't it be wonderful in the old days came from the idea of dissatisfaction with physical communities or physical places. So a lot of the people who were, who were enthusing about how wonderful online communities might be were also writing about how, um, how the sense of real community, the sense of belonging had, had dropped out of as it was then contemporary society that you know feeling that there was no physical community feeling that they had no attachments to community organizations they felt that digital might replace this rather than thinking about well actually if the community is broken don't we need to fix the community rather than put a digital plaster on it um so hence we've got what we're seeing now i think is is perhaps a result of some of those attitudes that digital is being seen in some ways as at best, second best, if you see what I mean, uh, and at worst toxic. So some of the things that I suggested that you might read um, in preparation for this section are really about this, that uh, people are worried about uh, the use of algorithms. You know, the A-level algorithm was a particular controversy for those of you not in the UK. This was uh, that um, an algorithm, supposedly, I'm sure it was much more complicated than one simple algorithm, was used to, um, to how shall we put it, 
sense check te- the, de- the grades that teachers awarded for A-level exams. And uh, the whole thing was an absolute disaster. And many parents ended up very stressed and very unhappy about this, never mind the students themselves. Um, so in a sense, what we've got is this idea that either people are genuinely worried about um, digital phenomena, you only have to see the amount of online, um, well, the amount of concern being expressed, whether it's online or in the um, in the press one way or another, about the effects of um, Facebook, various types of digital interaction, online bullying, mental health problems, all of those kinds of things, you know, the possible manipulation of the democratic process, etc. cetera. Um, there is this sense of toxicity or just that online is just really not good enough. Hence the article about, yes, of course you can actually do, you can do learning in digital space as people knew in the 1980s and mind the 1990s, but it just doesn't seem to be anywhere near as good. You know, students are saying, well, they, they like, physical presence at the moment of course they may not want it because they may be worried about um contagion but in kind of quotes normal times people do want physical presence so as i say what my my particular concern is that people are beginning to see the digital as as something worrying or just not very good Um, i think you know one of the things that that we might say is that there have been upsides to this. You know, some of these worries have meant that actually the social media companies having said that it was absolutely impossible for them in any way to control content have started to do so. How, you know, COVID has led social media companies to start issuing warnings about, you know, dangerous, possibly inaccurate posts that might be life-threatening. And we've seen this spreading to the discourse around the American election where, you know, some posts have been flagged up in a way that social media companies said they simply couldn't do six months to a year ago. And suddenly it turns out they can, you know, so so some of this anxiety could be positive. Um, We do know, I mean, I don't need to tell a group of information professionals what remarkable things one can do with digital resources uh, in, that, that really couldn't be done with the physical resource. We know this. So I'm not trying to question the value of, you know, the cognitive value of, of digital resources, which are genuinely useful and, you know, sometimes absolutely groundbreaking. Um, you can even have positive uses of algorithms, it turns out. Um, you know, there was a, a fascinating article the other day I was reading about somebody using AI to compare thousands of recordings of people with coughs to work out which is a, quote, COVID cough and which isn't, which could be extremely useful when it comes to diagnosis and indeed for helping people to work out whether they should be worried or not. Um, So I think I'm not going to go on for too much longer about this, uh, but I think one of the things we should start to think about is, okay, what how can we come up with a balanced view of some of this? We should, clearly the the hype that originally surrounded things digital was not realistic because it didn't take into account the fact that we are, we're physical people who live in a physical universe and we like social interaction. It's important to us to, to be around other people, to have experiences in a social way. At the same time, I think it's important not to get carried away with some of the perhaps digital dystopian attitudes of, oh my goodness, this stuff is all terrible. And if it's not terrible, it's just not very good. Um, I think some of this comes back to questions. I think one of, you know, one of the things we might suggest is that we need to think about the interaction of the human with the digital and what is causing potentially some of these problems. Um, we might want to go back to the you know quite the old days of digital library research and some of the big questions that we never really answered um for example i think that people get anxious about things that they can't they can't understand and they can't visualize so people you know we know this it's a it's an old thing that people can stand in front of a bookshelf and get a, get a rough idea of how many books there are. And they can look at a, a library and get roughly how, an idea of how big the library is. They can't do that with digital libraries. They, they have no idea how big a digital library is. They don't know if what they have found is a little bit or a lot or everything or, and this, this is an old question. 
but I think it's coming back to bite us now. When we start to think about the use of AI with you know millions of billions of data points, people can't visualize that. You know, when Greg Crane talked about what shall we do with a million books, even the idea of visualizing a million books, I mean, some librarians out there may be able to do that, but I can't. I can't even imagine what a million books is going to look like, never mind how should we manipulate that data. And I think some of the anxiety comes from this sense of my perception cannot encompass this. And I can't sense check it. You know, if I send a bit of AI off to do something, I launch a search of some kind, it brings me back the results. But how do I know that that's reasonable? I can't sense check it. I have to trust it. And yet I'm reading these news stories that tell me maybe these things aren't to be trusted. So how do we, you know, I, I think we need to go back to some of these questions. You know, how do we know that a resource is trustworthy? How do we understand the extent of something? How can we understand why we're getting the results we're getting? Um, and I think that's, you know, people will say, oh yeah, well, of course, you know, like Google will give you the first 10 results and say, well, there are goodness knows how many million possible hits on this. And we don't go through all the screens, most of us. Um, generally, you know, people are very happy to accept the first 10 hits, maybe not even the first 10. But I think in cases where it worries people, where it's a case of their health or their children's education, then they start to think, mm, how do we trust this thing? How do we know? What, what, if, what if it's not right? What if um, maybe I do need to know a bit more than the first 10 hits? And um, what happens if there's a consequence to this? And I think what we're being brought up with, uh, brought up to uh, at the moment in, in this COVID era is, there are some nasty consequences of, how should we put it, the use of algorithms. People don't understand how, what, what is happening, but they can understand that some of the things aren't good. You know, I think a lot of the, the controversy about should we have a lockdown or not, you know, people, this is in a sense the first digital epidemic. People in just normal people are able to see quite complicated statistical uh, projections are, you know, able to look at the disease statistics every day, for example, on the British government's um, dashboard, you know, using kind of real time mapping that, gosh, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, even would have been considered really state of the art stuff. But it's a, so we're seeing lots of numbers. But what does that mean? And what does all this digital information say? And how can it be that, you know, different lots of scientists look at this stuff and they come up with completely different conclusions. And I think you can see why that drives a sense of anxiety. Um, so I think my, I always come back to this. Um, and it, I, I always find this, it, it's good talking to a, an audience of librarians because I always come back to the idea that we have to come back to the people in this. We have to come back to the users. We have to try and understand where our users are and where they're coming from with this. You know, I'm trying to work out why do algorithms make people anxious? Why is it that we don't want to do everything in digital terms? Well, because we recognize that there is something about physicality that is important and in some cases very special if we're talking about things like art or museums or books. And it's, it's a case of, I think, coming back down to one of my colleagues when I was a PVCR um, talked really, really eloquently about the importance of getting the social science right, or in this case, perhaps the library science right, not just the science. In other words, uh, for example, he gave the um, example of GM food. Um, scientifically, that was great. You know, it could have had a lot of um, positive, you know, GM seeds and things like that could have helped with food um, security problems, et cetera, but people were very anxious. And the scientists never really explained why they shouldn't be anxious or perhaps well, their grounds whether they should be anxious. And what he talked about was saying, okay, the science was perfect, but the social science was rubbish. You know, we just did not engage with the, with the people and I think a lot of the what we're seeing around, you know, digital resources and COVID is a failure to engage with the social science, with the people aspects, with the users of it. Um, so, you know, I would finish with I think what I come up against is 
This is never about the technology, just the technology. This is about how people and technology and policy and health and um, you know politics, international relations and all that. It's how they all start to work in a system with each other, but it's not just a technical system. And we have to realize that humans are part of the system. And this goes right back to cybernetic ideas that were being aired in the 1940s. This is not particularly new, but it's often something that people find difficult to work with. Um, so I think people aren't being unreasonable. Um, it is reasonable to be anxious about things. It is reasonable to say, I'm a social being, I want to socialize. But how do we work to support interaction with the digital in that context? Well, that is what I'm hoping to discuss with you today. So that's all from me. I hope we've got some really interesting questions and remarks. Well, um, that provocation certainly was a provocation and we have got some great questions coming through. So thanks everyone who's popped the questions um, into the, well, in fact, both the chat channel and also the Q&A, but they're all coming through to me here. So that's brilliant. I think you really provoked a lot of people into thinking around about trust. Um, and certainly when we first spoke, that was one of the things that I was really struck with and especially looking at the sort of reading as well, that trust and digital and how can we create trust in, in digital when it is so amorphous, doesn't have a sort of physicality to it and how can we demonstrate to, because quite often we are producers of digital outputs, we have you know digital libraries and e-resources, so how can we get our users to understand what is trustworthy within this digital environment and kind of regenerate that trust? I think, actually, I think librarians have a hugely important role to play in this. Um, I think, you know, perhaps it's been, you know, we go right back to the days when people talk about disintermediation and certain libraries, without mentioning any names, um, started saying, oh, we don't need librarians. They, you know, all our users can just Google stuff, um, which, of course, turned out, thankfully, to be entirely wrong. Um, but I think it's that question of librarians are very gifted intermediaries who, like digital humanities professionals, in fact, speak the language of the technical and the digital, but they also speak the language of the human. And I think, you know, one of the, the really important roles in building trust is, you know, this is one of the librarian skill sets, the being able to mediate between what people know and what people need to know. Um, so I think, you know, in a sense, it, I think it's fascinating that, um, our students, I'm sure a lot of other people out there are finding this, our students want to be in the library when they work. I mean, of course, at the moment they can't be, but I'm sure they'll be very happy to get back to that. Um, partly, of course, because they want to be able to socialise with their friends, but partly because they want to be able to ask people if they've got a query or a problem. And of course, you can do that um, online and they might do um, another day. But just being able to have that kind of dialogue with a librarian so I think that the face-to-face -face kind of roles, you know, it, this hasn't gone away. If anything, there are more and more students every year who want to work in the, in the library and want to be able to talk to people. I, I think also there are all sorts of issues that, again, they go back quite a long way in terms of digital libraries about how do we reassure people that this resource is, is trustworthy? And then you get into complicated questions about metadata and RDF and all that kind of stuff, which... The problem about that is that while information professionals and um, digital humanities people understand that kind of complexity, it, general, your average user doesn't. So, um, or may do, but it's not, it's not common. Metadata, um, it, it, it's not easy to understand. So I think, I think we kind of gave up on that a bit. I think we all thought, okay, well, great. You know, there's Google now, it's fine. People will just Google stuff. It doesn't matter. The page rank will sort it out. And it, it sort of did to some extent, but I, I think, you know, some of these questions that we, we started asking ourselves in the 1990s and 2000s, we never really answered. And I think this question of how do we not just convince our colleagues, but our users that something is, trustworthy and maybe even enjoyable to use is it's not an answered question at all so you know I, I think that is something I 
I have to hand back to the librarians because I think you guys are, are the experts. So from what you're saying, there's really is a kind of role for us educationally to kind of as information professionals to help people understand. I think this was um, one of the points from the questions, you know, is is that one of our roles within the library to help people understand what is trustworthy? How do we understand algorithms and data and that we should kind of start picking up that role a little more um, and doing mm. more around about that? Mm. OK. Picking up on some of the other questions that have come through, um, there's quite a few round about, um, have we just fallen out of love with the digital because of the fact that algorithms have proven to be untrustworthy or distorting things? Um, has there become a sort of lopsided reporting and portrayal of different digital elements so that we now no longer love it the way we were so enthusiastic once upon a time? Mm. Yeah, I, I think we have a bit. Um, I mean, this is always a problem, isn't it? This is how the hype cycle works. Um, if, if, I'm sure everybody's seen that graph. You know, you, you have that, um, you know, do you start off with a new thing and it, it, it's enormously hyped and then um, then you get into the trough of despond or whatever it's called. And then it, it tends to pick up and these, these things fluctuate. I think what's interesting is that perhaps... Um, for those of us who've been working in digital humanities or in, you know, in the information profession, we've been thinking about these issues for quite a long time. But it was quite difficult to, to get journalists or politicians to be interested in them back in the day. Now, suddenly people are interested. Suddenly people are worried about, you know, cyber terrorism or cyber attacks or um, algorithms or, you know, how do we trust the information we have and what might be the effect of it? And I, I think, in a sense, we have as information professionals seen it before, we have to start thinking, well, okay, this is the same wave effect. We have to hope that we come up the other side of it. Because I think, you know, what is needed is a really um, a, balanced, um, a balanced consideration of, yes, there are some things that digital resources perhaps don't do so well, but on the other hand, there are also some good things, you know, that we sh we need not to be journalistic about it. You know, for for those of us who are um, somewhat introverted, uh, actually, lockdown has been, whisper it, really quite fun, uh, because you know, for some some people don't enjoy a huge amount of of social contact. Some people quite like working at home, quite like talking to colleagues online, and especially people who are neurodiverse. Um, this may, you know, literally have made their life hugely better. So, it, you know, there are positive aspects um, to digital interaction. And I think it, it may be incumbent upon some of us who were once upon a time, the enthusiasts, um, though we are, you know, sometimes our role is rightfully to critique, but sometimes our role is to remind people, hey, you know what, this stuff is still great. You know, I was just thinking today as I'm obviously working at home, you know, here I am with my tiny little iPad that is no bigger than a book. And, you know, sometimes I'm um, reading and using voice notes to just dictate notes. Sometimes I am carrying it downstairs um, during my lunch break, plugging it into the TV and watching some terrible program from um from Netflix or something like that. But, but you know, and I'm, I was just thinking, God, isn't this wonderful? You know, this is just such a tiny little thing and yet it's so powerful. And because I've just been writing about, you know, what, what, are, what the net looked like and what computers looked like in 1990. And I just thought, you know, this is miraculous. We have to remember, this is a wonderful thing. And in a sense, it is, it is our job to remind people that this is wonderful as well as terrible. And I think, again, that was one of the um, pointers that uh, or questions that were kind of coming through that reflecting on where our users are currently and how they're feeling around about digital. And I think what you expressed just there was some of the kind of joy. And I think, you know, we're all probably quite relieved that we're in lockdown, you know, at this particular point in time, because digitally we can just find another film on Netflix or read a book or get something when we're not allowed out. But again, then there is this whole, you know, 
how do we deal with the sort of sheer volume of data that we've got? And I think another idea that's sort of coming through from the questions is around about how we how we as users start thinking around about that data and also our behaviors, how we behave with that data and what are the ethics for it? And I think, is that something you could just reflect on? How do we manage our data ethically and present it? Oh, that is really interesting. Um... Could you say a bit more about the, are you thinking about kind of things like algorithmic bias and things like that? Yes, so there's been quite a number of things around about the algorithms and the distortions and also the lopsided idea of empowerment, which is compounding the digital divide that we're coming mm. across. And then again, we're beginning to sort of see, you know, at Edinburgh, we've got the chair in data ethics mm. and we're beginning to recognise that actually it's not the algorithms in themselves that are creating bias or distortion it's how they are applied and it's around about thinking about that wider kind of social cultural context in which you're applying those particular algorithms in order to understand what's happening mm. what do you think we can do around about that so that that joy of digital that you were touching on isn't perhaps lost and that we aren't so fearful but that we balance it yeah okay um I see where you're coming from on that one I'm yeah I mean I, I actually think it's very, very important that some of these issues have come to the fore. And I, in a sense, I welcome the A-level algorithm fiasco because it has made people think about, okay, what are these things? And what, what, what effect are they having on our life? And of course, you know, many of the accounts were, you know, trivialized and, and it, I find it kind of interesting that we all know um, that, you know, those of us who have um, children are going through our university admissions, all those of us who've been involved in it for our department or whatever, know that there are always going to be, if you've got highly selective universities, uh, kids who simply do not achieve the grades they wanted to get. And of course, they're upset and disappointed. But that happens every year because children are, young adults are fallible, teachers are sometimes too optimistic, sometimes something weird happens in the exams. And there's this, uh, there's this understanding that, you know, weird things can happen with humans because we're human. Somehow we expect that an algorithm never makes mistakes. So, you know, there was, there was the fury about the algorithm because it's like, but these kids haven't got the grades they expected. Well, yes, but that happens every year. But we were, you know, people were thinking, yes, but it's not right if a human decides that. It, it, you know, it, 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 so it's, it's kind of, sorry, it's not right if an, if an algorithm decides it. it it's, it's not understandable. We there was sort of an extra level of fear, and I think it's very important, therefore, that that these things are beginning to be discussed, and that you know subsequently and quietly, some uh, local authorities started to think about whether they should drop the use of algorithms in terms of evaluating and guiding welfare provision, which has been highly controversial but only highly controversial if you're kind of interested in this stuff. Um, so I think there is a beginning of a sense of um, the discourse is changing, you know, the discourse of, well, how, you know, what effects could these things have? It is the sort of thing we should be discussing much more. You know, it's good that it's in the popular press. It's good that journalists are talking about it. We need to be talking about it more at universities. As you say, it's it's good that we, we also have a recent appointment in algorithmic bias at Durham. I think it's something that people are beginning to be aware of. You know, the algorithms do not write themselves yet. You know, they might at some point, but but they're written by humans. And therefore, the, all of these questions are complex and work into questions about equality, diversity, bias that humans have and algorithms have. But if you bake them into an algorithm, then things become more complex. So I, I think that it is a matter of open discussion. It's the sort of thing that, you know, way back in the day when I was at, at UCL doing what now sounds like an extremely old fashioned um, program I used to run called Electronic Communication and Publishing. It sounds just, you know, incredibly creaky, but, but you know, these were the sorts of things. We didn't discuss algorithms, but we did discuss a lot of these issues at the time. And I remember thinking, yeah, but you know what? This needs to be widely discussed. It doesn't just need to be, you know, 30 students who happen to have taken this course who go out into the world and understand it. There needs to be a much wider level of understanding. I think I, I'm not convinced that we've still got that level of discussion in universities. We're beginning to. 
but I think I think we really need to to keep keep working on that which is a great segue into one of the questions um, that um, Michelle Blake put is how do we need to engage with our local communities within the university and wider to kind of make sure that trust and digital is understood especially seeing as we've got quite a kickback at the moment um, around about people being sick of experts and not really wanting to trust them and I think again during the pandemic what we've discovered the advice keeps changing and people have found that really challenging so again we're sort of in that position as you know professionals being being experts mm -hmm. how do we kind of get that role and relationship right and build the right communication with mm -hmm. that community that is very difficult. Um, I am, I'm not at all sure I have answers for that. I, I, one of the things I would say is, I think it's about what people, my sense is that what people have tired of is just being talked at and told stuff uh, during the pandemic. One of the things that, again, I think librarians and museum professionals are very good at is actually involving people in terms of bringing them in and um, asking people to engage in co-creation and um, thinking about how, okay, we're thinking about things like special collections and museums, but what questions do our communities, our users want to ask of these things? What do they want to see? And it's interesting, we've got a really successful project at Durham, um, which is actually run out of our computer science uh, department um, called Tech Up, which is about involving people from the local community who haven't had um, the educational opportunities that they might have liked to have. Um, this is women in in coding, in learning how to code. In um, you know, the, the idea is to improve their career prospects, but also I think the sheer experience of coming into a university, uh, meeting people who are called professor so and so. Um, getting involved is has been a really positive one because it's beginning to break down some of the some of the walls if you like that they're not real they're perceptual walls between our community doesn't necessarily think it has anything you know that it doesn't really think about interacting directly with academics or with information professionals i think this is something you know information professionals do and could do really well thinking about how do we you know, our university libraries are very much, you know, big buildings into which you never go unless you're a student. Um, it, are there ways to integrate the way library provision works and in terms of the community as well as, um, as, well as academic libraries? You know, what, what links do we have with the things that Marcus Rashford's talking about, about uh, books as well as food? For, for kids who've not had many opportunities. You know, the fact that he never read a book until he was 17. You know, how do we how do we break these things down? Again, I don't feel I'm sufficiently expert to, to give the answers, but I do think it's about working actively with the community rather than just talking at it. And again, we've had some a number of questions around about what you're beginning to touch on there, that sort of digital physical. I think within the universities, quite often the library is seen very much as a physical building where you go to study and you get access to the books. But in reality, actually, most of the content or a lot of the content that our students are accessing is digital. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it'll be more digital than it will be the physical. And again, there's another kind of question here around about that, you know, We've got these blended digital physical spaces. How do we navigate between the two and make people aware of each side of it? And again, I think you touched on, you know, there's a joy in that digital, but there's also we take real pleasure in the physical. Um, and for some of us, our physical books are, you know, magical things. Mm. But then we also have the digital. So how do we navigate that? Mm. Yeah, I, I stop me if I go on about this because I could I could go on about it for hours and frequently do um, but you know this is this is one of the really fascinating research questions of our time or at least it is to me you know I think I'm going to be working on this question for the rest of my career and I've been working on it for a few years now it turns out that you know how do we move between physical and digital information spaces well it seems so simple when in, back in the day we just thought okay, a digital library is a new thing. We, all we'll do is provide training courses for people. They've used physical libraries. It'll be fine. They can read a book. They can read stuff in a digital library. No problem. End of, end of thing. No, turns out 
really, really complicated. And that the, firstly, the information skills that we have in physical spaces turn out to be very, very complicated and not necessarily easy to translate into digital things. Um, my husband knows that I, I sort of do anthropology on him, if you like. Um, you know, he is an academic, he is a historian, uh, but, you know, sometimes I, I marvel at the fact that he can find some digital things difficult when he's actually really quite good at using a computer. And I think that's the problem. We, we underestimate how difficult some of this stuff is and how for some people it's intuitive and for others not. And they're not technophobes at all. It's just, it's not intuitive. The emotional aspects are, you know, that's kind of straightforward to some extent. The emotional aspects are really fascinating. These questions of how do we feel about our environment? You know, as you said, books, we love books. And, you know, the, some of the stuff I've been reading recently for my book, um, you know, back in the 1990s, people were really terrified that we would lose our books. You know, there was a sense of grief that came out of the writings at the time. Um, it hasn't happened. You know, there are more and more books published and, you know, the digital share of the market goes down in relative terms in the last few years. Because, because books evoke an emotional reaction, because books are, you know, reading is a social activity, especially reading with children. Um, and we are only beginning to understand this relatively recently, but it is certainly not true that the younger people are, the more they love digital stuff, they don't. And the research that uh, one of my former PhD students and now colleagues, Laura Dietz has done on this, does suggest that in fact, there's, if anything, there's an opposite age effect, but young people love books, you know, young people might well just as well enjoy visiting a museum, um, they don't necessarily want to visit it in digital space. We don't, we do know that people don't tend to, in fact, almost never um, express any strong, really strong emotion, strong aura, strong wonder about digital environments and digital objects whereas they would with pretty much exactly the same, you know, the, the original of the thing that's been digitized would evoke a completely different reaction. And we don't really very much know why at the moment. Um, there's, some, there's some suggestion, we got a little bit of evidence that this might be slightly different with art objects. Um, but uh, unfortunately the rest of that research, we, this was a, a pilot study and the rest of the research didn't get funded. So uh, we've kind of stopped doing research on that, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, this is, this is really fascinating. And a lot of it is to do with how do our brains work? You know, we can cognitively, we can understand the text that we're reading, whether it's from a physical text or uh, a, a digital text, but even then it's difficult. The longer the text is, the more difficult it is for us to, us to deal with it in, in digital space. Even my colleagues, mathematicians will tell me that if they've got a really difficult math proof they wanna work on, they do not want to work on an iPad. Thank you very much. You know, we, we've recently built a new computer science and maths building in Durham and they absolutely insisted that we must have whiteboards in the corridors so that people <laughs> could get together and write things on whiteboards and solve problems together. Yeah. And I think that tells you a huge amount, both about the sort of the social effect of mathematics, but also, you know, I've talked to colleagues in math about this and they said, no, I, I just can't understand complexity in maths if I'm having to do it in a digital space. I need to see it in front of me. So whether it's cognitive aspects, whether it's emotional aspects and the way that these two things or three things we talk about social, the way these all kind of mesh in together turn out to be really interesting. And I think it's to do something to do with multi-sensory input and that digital mm -hmm. channels, we're usually only using two senses. Today, we're using our sight and our hearing. Yeah. We can't touch and we can't smell and we can't taste. And we certainly don't have that, whatever it's sense it's called, but that sense of being in a group, which is another sense. That's yes, and that effort. kind of feedback yeah. loop that you get yeah, so at the moment we don't know if we've bored everyone or whether everyone exactly. is truly yeah, so fascinated <laughs> about this but it's something that I find absolutely fascinating so no yeah and I too find this a particularly interesting area and I think again we've got another great question um I'm not quite sure who posed this one it came through the chat but it's around about that sustainability of digital mm. um we're all very much conscious that you know climate change and we need to kind of reduce um, 
fossil fuel reductions and so on. And the internet is, um, as it so nicely says here, the world's largest fossil fuel burning machine. So how can we ooh, reduce digital addiction and enforce adherence to digital culture, which is unsustainable in order to help support and make those climate changes? So I think what you were saying earlier is quite fascinating because actually we haven't all, we're currently shifting to digital because of the situation but we don't seem naturally inclined to. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. As you say, we are not naturally inclined to go into digital spaces unless you are a sort of weird digital humanities geek such as myself. Um, but, you know, generally people aren't. And I think these questions of the impact of digital on climate change have been relatively it's just not really considered. I mean, we're all aware that, well, isn't it great that we're not flying at the moment because, you know, that's lowering emissions um, from flying hugely and that's great. And, you know, being online can help us not to fly. And I think that's, that is important. But yeah, I mean, when you think about the, the sheer heat that is, is created by server, um, you know, banks of servers. Um, at Durham, we have, um, huge capacity in HPC, the biggest of any university in the north of England. And that's wonderful, but uh, our buildings are, we, we will have to build new buildings to be able to recycle that heat. It turns out that it is ruinously expensive to backwards engineer a building to, to cope with the cooling, you know, the heat and the water that come out from the cooling from computers. And there have to, I think there have to be thoughts about this. You know, how do we, how do we reuse some of those things? And there was a wonderful uh, occasion when I was in Paris um, a few years ago when I was on the Comité Scientifique uh, for the Campus Condorcet, which is in um, Aubervilliers. And that is a what used to be a very big brownfield site. It used to be kind of big kind of um, warehouses, factories, etc. And now is partly it's turning into Campus Consorcier, which is a university site, but also um, some high tech um, businesses. And one of these had, um, I was walking along a road uh, one, one day with, with some locals and I said, there are palm trees growing along there. How come there are palm trees in Paris outside? And they said, Oh, well, that'll be the cooling from, um, from that's a big um, server farm in there. And they're using the water to grow palm trees, which was, uh, you know, a wonderful thought. So in some ways we could and should be thinking about how do we, how do we use the apparent waste products from, uh, from computing in a better and more sustainable way. It doesn't have to be palm trees. It could be vegetables. Um, it could be, you know, things that will help feed us all, but, yeah, I mean, there. I think it's a bit, uh, it struck me the other day, it's a bit like car use. You know, for many years, people just blithely went around using their cars until someone said, uh, what about the effect of all these fossil fuels? And I think we've all been blithely using our computers with literally no thought to what um, what the effects may be. So, so yeah, this is a, it's just beginning to be an issue now. And I, I do think it's something we're going to have to think about further I mean you know the dear old book yeah. is wonderfully sustainable it keeps going for years if you look yes. after it nicely and it doesn't emit anything except when it's been and it's initially transported so yeah I, I think I think we have, to, we have to rethink some of these questions. Although we've had some interesting kind of chat coming through as well people just reflecting that because we've got digital technology and because we're in this current situation we're not commuting um, in the way that we were which was also kind of mm. causing um, climate change so th there mm. is a flip side to it the technology is enabling some things but also occasionally um, creates harm and I think as you were sort of saying it's that idea of kind of looking at reuse um, and, and kind of rethinking some of the way we deal with things. Um, I'm just trying to have a look. We've had a huge range of questions um, and uh, things coming through us around about loneliness and anxiety, which you also touched on um, within that digital space. Um, so I think, um, is that something you would like to just reflect on for a couple of minutes? And then I'm afraid, I think we'll have to finish up. Yeah, I just, I mean, I've just been quickly looking at the chat and the, and the okay. Q&A. We've got so many things in there. I wish we had more time to talk about them, but maybe we can, 
we can think about how could we deal with this and how could we, yeah, anyway, let's think about some of the issues coming up. But yeah, I mean, the loneliness issue, I mean, it is strange, isn't it? That, I mean, I think it's made us think more about these questions of neurotypical and neurodiverse people because um, for many neurotypical people, lockdown has been incredibly difficult. You know, they, we, people have been missing their families and their friends and work has been, you know, the, even the, the, the literally no water cooler moments because nobody has a water cooler. Yes. Um, I, think some, I think some workplaces and some groups of friends have been really creative in terms of thinking about how can we try and help? You know, how can we re- replace this even slightly? So we're having a my, my department is having a departmental coffee break every every Thursday morning at 11, just so people can join. And it's that's for the staff, but you know, the students are finding all sorts of um, ways that they can keep in contact with people when they're having to be, you know, kept in households and not able to socialize. So I think in a certain way, digital has been fantastic in that sense, because we know it's not the same and we know it doesn't replace, but where would we be without it? I mean, my goodness, at the moment, you know, um, imagine this has happened 20 years ago. We, how would we have communicated? You know, we had, so, we, we simply could not be doing what we're doing now. You know, we just, it would not have been possible in terms of the bandwidth available and the technology available. So in a sense, we, we should be deeply grateful for it. I think it also does remind us that, you know, for our, colleagues and friends who are not neuro, uh, neurotypical, who are neurodiverse, this may have been a huge relief. You know, some people may be um, feeling much less stressed because if they don't, um, if, if physical interaction is, is more challenging, then in some ways this, this has been a kind of sanctuary. And I think in some cases that, that means that we as employers um, and maybe even friends and relatives need to think again about how, how should we interact in future? Do we always have to interact face to face? Could we think about, okay, we've all learned that trying to have a part face to face and part online meeting is a total nightmare and teaching is even worse. But, you know, could we think about how, how do we respond to the needs of people for whom you know, big social gatherings and face-to-face meetings are not easy. So yeah. you know, perhaps that's a that's a positive piece of awareness that may have been created. So I'm going to be relentlessly cheerful about this. <laughs> no, and I think, again, there's been a really interesting kind of, kind of comment through about, you know, we almost need to create a third kind of space, a kind of mixed space. Um, and especially for libraries, that's something we maybe need to think mm. around about and think around about our different users because they mm. are all in different places. And some have really welcomed this, as you've so nicely highlighted, and some have found this just a little bit more challenging. So we do need to think around about that.